today we are um, presenting our concept of anti-racist teaching practice. I am here with Dr. Miguel Zavala uh, of uh, Cal State uh, Los Angeles. And I'm also here with uh, Mrs. Monique Marshall of, let me, uh, what's your institution again? I am a teacher at Wildwood School, elementary school. So we've got some um, practical wisdom here and uh, we're gonna get started with our presentation. So I'm gonna go first, I'm gonna share my screen. And my job in this webinar is to Uh, introduce the definition of what anti-racist um, practice is. Uh, once again, I'm Antoinette Linton. I'm a professor here at Cal State Fullerton, and I'm the facilitator of the anti-racist uh, teaching webinar. Uh, before we get started, um, I want to introduce a new perspective of teacher in this day and age, and I think grounding the purpose of teaching within the anti-racist teaching webinar is exceptionally important. Um, basically, the purpose of teaching is to apply the values, social, cultural principles, and the technical aspects of teaching to the specific needs of students and of restoring the eldership function to the teaching profession. And so to facilitate the discussion of teacher as a trustworthy content expert whose integrity and intentionality of practice facilitates the psychological healing, the restoration, and the epistemic agency of historically oppressed people. And the reason why I put those things together is to truly focus on uh, the intentionality of practice um, and the healing and the restoration of uh, historically oppressed people is important because sometimes we just get caught up in just studying the oppression of folks without moving towards how do we stop oppressing people and how we facilitate the expressions of their funds of knowledge and their assets. So when we talk about anti-racist teaching practice, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about moving forward, not just recognizing oppression, but actively doing something to restore people and their children. So anti-racist teaching, um, is defined here by combining Dr. Abram X. Kendi's work with uh, the work of actually Dr. Etta Hollins and her definition of teacher practice. And so uh, an anti-racist uh, teacher is one who is supporting an anti-racist policy through their actions or expressing an anti-racist idea. So using this as a guide, uh, the definition for anti-racist teacher practice is one who plans for, enacts, and interprets and translates student learning outcomes that reliably produces epistemic, intellectual, and creative agency that empowers students to pursue the professional endeavors of their choosing. And the reason why it's about empowering students for the professional endeavors as opposed to closing racial or ethnic gaps is because, uh, according to the NAEP data, there are no demographics of children in the United States who are 50% literate in any subject. So to compare two failing groups like blacks to whites is not productive. What we need to do is get everybody literate because no demographic is literate uh, above 50% in this country. So we're, I'm also trying to break the concept that somehow or another uh, the system is actually functioning for white children because it's not functioning for white or Asian children either. So we want to put that out there. So we want kids to have the agency that empowers them to choose professional endeavors that they see themselves in, you know, in the future and their families. And last but not least, uh, anti-racist pedagogy is a system of practices that includes socially, culturally, and historically grounded reflections that influence how a teacher plans, enacts learning episodes, and interprets and translates student performance and outcomes. And these practices are used to intentionally empower children to define themselves as capable and epistemologically literate human beings. So uh, I'm going to give the floor to my colleagues 
uh, set, hopefully I've set the stage appropriately for them. And I'm very much so looking forward to um, the, the rest of the presentation. All right, well, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Antoinette, for laying that groundwork. It's so important um, because what I've also found is absent working with definitions. We, what we mean by anti-racism can take different forms and mean anything. Mm -hmm. in the present moment that we're in, somebody reminded me, even when I say social justice, I shouldn't assume things. The white supremacists think they're doing social justice work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. clear with our terms um, and what I'm doing here in this brief presentation is um, looking at teaching and the translation of anti-racist principles and so in the work that I do at Cal CLA it's uh, been a really important process as director of the urban learning program um, translating what seems like really huge and big impacts us every day to like the preparation of teachers like, learning to teach. How do we do that? And um, what I want to begin with is differentiating between anti-racist practices, anti-racist education projects, and anti-racist teaching. Often they get conflated. And this, the way I'm going to speak to these, um, it's not about creating binaries, but think of them as kind of nested systems. These are interrelated. What ends up happening is that often um, folks in, in, in my business, uh, when they talk about social justice, anti-racist work, we're talking about it in more macro terms, which is, I define as anti-racist practices. And these are pretty much um, about the social, political, historical, micro and macro practices of everyday life that may take place um, at the grassroots level, but also in institutions. So those are the bigger sort of things that are taking place. But how do we then begin to think of anti-racist principles and how those get enacted in education projects that take shape in education settings, such as schools, but also in non-formal spaces, such as in community-based centers? Um, so I'm thinking of schools, but I'm also thinking of where education happens. But when I think about anti-racist teaching, um, this is a nested doll moving into something more concrete is how do anti-racist principles get enacted in the teaching spaces of the classroom? I'm really centering classroom spaces. I'm being intentional about that. It's my teacher preparation uh, work that I do. And this is not to say that education is not happening in family settings. It's not to say that it's not happening in grassroots spaces, but in by, but I would argue that by us talking about anti-racist teaching without addressing classrooms, um, we're missing a whole mass institution. And so um, for me, I draw here from Dr. Ada Hollins in thinking about teaching that centers uh, pedagogical design and mediation and includes cycles of planning, enacting, interpreting, and translating. If you will, this is like kind of the, the arc the architectural structure, if we broke down systematically of what teaching dimensions include. So um, this is, again, one way of thinking about like anti-racist teaching. By that, I mean specifically looking at cycles of planning, enacting, interpreting, and translating. Um, that can happen in many spaces, but I'm looking at classrooms um, as a major one. And um, I'm going to talk through a little bit of the ways we can think about um, anti-racist teaching and I frame this as a relational view but I think what's important is to think about this problem of translation and for me it's like thinking about practices in one domain and how do we translate those to another and I really like the metaphor of interweaving um, that values uh, that that focus on the values visions of possible worlds and working principles into our work as educators an anti-racist praxis that centers pedagogical design and mediation. Um, interweaving is a distinct metaphor for defining context. So typically, if you look at a basic dictionary definition, context is that which surrounds. And um, some folks who have studied space talk about it as a very Eurocentric notion that space is points, lines, planes. But what happens when it's more than that and it's relational? Space and context are not empty containers. They're more than that. And um, I'm working here towards a more iterative 
co-constitutive view as dynamic processes and practices. The practice piece is key because for me to talk about anti-racist teaching and try to think about how that translates to different settings, I also have to center practice. Otherwise, I end up at the level of theory. Even the language that I'm using can be very theoretical. And so I'm talking about anti-racism. What does that look like? And I know um, Monique's going to be breaking down more concrete stuff, but um, when I think about this relational view of anti-racist teaching, there are what I call external dimensions to it. And by external, think of like, here's the practice of teaching in classrooms, but what are the contexts that are integral to, that one might say surround, but are integral to? So the questions that I ask are, what communities and spaces make anti-racist teaching possible? How do Black indigenous people of color as teachers and students and their families co-design learning spaces? How are they a part of those? How do schools operate with principles of racial consciousness and relationality, do they? And how do institutional advocates and leaders who are positioned in places, i.e. like principals, how do they leverage their positionalities so as to work towards collective healing? Um, and those are more kind of the contextual broader questions, but in the context of anti-racist teaching, the internal questions to ask are how are teaching practices informed by, interwoven with principles of anti-racist praxis? How, for example, is lesson design, curricular selection informed by these principles? How is pedagogical mediation, the breaking down, the scaffolding informed by these principles? How is student assessment informed by these principles? And in my experience, it's like student assessment is seen as like this, it's an evil, because it's been uh, uh, generally a narrative that it's only certain things, but it's not seen as something dynamic that informs our teaching. And I also cannot think of my own teacher education work. I don't know what it means if it doesn't have an assessment piece that I then reflect on and that loops back into thinking of how I can do things better. So how is reflection and translation? And for me, one of those examples is redesigning of units informed by these principles. Um, so I'm gonna walk through as an exam example of something I taught, and this was a six week course. It served primarily Brown students. Um, and these students came uh, to this course uh, around this theme of critically analyzing and challenging poverty. And if you notice the flow of this curriculum, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the kinds of tensions that emerge. My being anti-racist was very intentional about thinking about the design of the kinds of things I was teaching. And there's many levels happening here. One, because it's a writing and research seminar course that got translated into what I later termed an action research in the barrio, barrio as a neighborhood class. Um, I was one responsible for teaching certain literacy skills, writing was a focal area. But how do I do that from an anti-racist lens? And so on one level, what I have is how do we learn certain genres of writing by actually reading folks like Eduardo Galeano or reading Malcolm X's um, autobiography of Malcolm X, um, even excerpts from Pedagogy of the Oppressed. So there were multiple things happening. One is teaching certain skills, but teaching those skills of writing in the context of reading from actual folks who have written. But my intentionality came by carefully selecting texts from the voices of folks of color who were coming from actually very uh, amazing and radical traditions. And so week one is becoming critical writers and researchers. Like, what does it even mean to be a writer? What does it mean to be a researcher? How do we unpack that? Where do we see examples of that? Then I transitioned into defining, and um, this is part of a model of teaching writing where we look at genres. We looked at ways in which society defines who we are in terms of all of our identities. And because the students had chosen this theme of poverty, um, we, I was very intentional looking at the open veins of Latin America. That's a text that gave us a more broader historical understanding of brown peoples coming from Latin America that are situated in the U.S. Southwest and how they can understand the historical construction of poverty. Um, what I focused on, if you notice key assignment, it was an extended definition of poverty that the students developed and um, just beautiful stories that 
build from dictionary definitions, but that are also extended, that bring their own analyses, that bring texts, but also their lived experience. And it's why it's called extended or stretch definition. Um, we work then from there towards counter storytelling, where we looked at data. So we, if it's a research course, we're going to actually do research. And I was teaching them how to read demographic data and how to understand it and also taught them other qualitative strategies, um, which took form under week four, five, and six. So the latter part of this class was around identifying themes and problems. Um, a lot of this, the way I taught this course, can feel like a master's level course where we're looking at a topic, we're refining it, what are the kinds of problems of practice we're addressing in and through those questions of inquiry that are designed, how are we going to go about studying it? So I had to teach students different research strategies and they undertook their research and the beauty of it, um, all of this led to a symposium where they presented their findings and obviously also wrote a report because writing, that's also a genre that I was teaching, the culminating experience of a symposium together with a report. Um, so I just want to reflect here on uh, the tensions and possibilities in this design. And so the choices that are made, um, texts are selected given the critical lenses they elicit and serve as mediating tools and artifacts. I don't choose those. They're not haphazard, the selection of these texts. And the selection of those comes from me looking at these texts very carefully to see how is it that I can leverage those to one, what I was saying, teaching these writing skills, but also like the content and moving towards another level of seeing the, of students um, seeing themselves as critical researchers. Um, the lived curriculum for me is a more complex process that involves moving with and alongside students as they develop literacies. So I don't have the space to go uh, deep into this, but we got stuck on chapter three. Um, sorry, we got stuck on the third paragraph of the open veins of Latin America. But what we do and what good teachers do is we do pause and we take through that pause, we then facilitate further learning. And it had to do with one, the vocabulary and also the concept of development and underdevelopment. And what I did is I just scaffold that further. And these three days that it took us to unpack these three paragraphs and revisiting for me were very important and took the learning um, further. Um, so slowing down is really key. Often we feel like we have to hurry and that's typical when we feel we're not necessarily engaging in learning that's situated, but our goal is like covering content. And I know a lot of um, teachers feel that way, but in this space I was teaching this class, um, I had the luxury of actually being able to spend those three days um, to unpack these paragraphs. Um, there's also these tensions that emerge between teacher-led design versus student-centered versus community of practice frame. I, I for one, um, have seen how uh, words like facilitation seem to be uh, taken as synonymous with student-centered, but I've also had these conversations with other folks who have apprenticed me to think about like um, the expertise we bring and facilitation needs some form of guided practice. Um, otherwise we can kind of spin in circles and what would you like to learn? But what are the actual goals that I bring as a teacher and what are the kinds of things that I would like to develop and making those explicit, but also being open as we move with students to kind of shift and change. And so another way of talking about this is facilitation versus guided thinking versus generative knowing. And I really believe that all these processes are happening all at once. When we were moving with these texts, I'm also learning alongside students, but I've also um, carefully selected the text that we're engaging in. I'm, if you will, two steps ahead in the sense of thinking about how I'm going to facilitate the learning that's unfolding. But it's generative because generative ultimately means that there's a co-construction. There's a social construction of knowledge taking place. And I really believe, I um, just want to leave with this, that anti-racist um, teaching invites us all to... Um, be attuned also with our pedagogy. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a curriculum, but also how we move pedagogically with students. And as we transition to uh, uh, Mrs. Monique Marshall, I wanted to point out to the audience that uh, Miguel's demonstration and presentation um, is a um, an example of what Hollins describes as the 
uh, disciplinary literacy um, uh, for pedagogical practice that engages students in the discourse, documentation, and notation, knowledge production, representation, and application, and argumentation, critique, and interpretation, commonly practiced in the discipline as a way to construct deep knowledge of a subject matter. When you made your decisions intentionally in the curriculum and then intentionally engaged them in the disciplinary uh, notation and documentation and practices, that is anti-racist teaching practice, right? So it's a marrying of a critical lens and engagement with real voices of the community and of the demographic, but it does not leave at the wayside the actual skill set that will eventually help these children close the, I don't even want to say the achievement gap, but get to where they want to be uh, in the literacy and in the capital in which they choose to be. So regardless of what they're reading and writing, you gave them the skills to get in there deeply and that's what we're talking about. So now uh, Ms. Monique is going to give us another example of that very thing. Yeah, I just am sitting in such awe of both of you. Um, it really is an honor. Thank you both for just inviting me in. <clears throat> you know, from my elementary school perspective, listening to you, both of you, um, feels really affirming uh, to the work that I do in my classroom on a day-to-day -day basis. I've been teaching in the classroom for 30 years now. And uh, I don't know, anti-racist practice is just, it just is best practice. There's really no, no other way around it. <clears throat> so I'm going to begin um, I have in my few minutes with you, there's a lot that I could share, but I'm going to talk about this shifting um, of a traditional model, the co-creation of anti-racist action in loving collaborative community. Uh, there's a piece here that, that I don't know, there's so much that both of you said that resonates for me, but, um, you know, I heard stopping oppression like how are we actively restoring people dr linton i think you said that and um you know and i think the the idea of using practice and uh the work that we're doing in the classroom starting as as little as like when they're in preschool it's just it's huge um and i've seen really beautiful things happen at, in a in a like a heart space uh, between people that may never have met if it wasn't for maybe the imagination um, the openness and the willingness of of their teachers to lean in to, to actively co-creating you know with the children uh, my passion is working with the littlest of the learners i currently teach fifth grade but I spent many years in a K-1-2 classroom. And I believe that the younger our students are, just the more potential they have um, for just big thinking. I think a lot of people seem to think opposite, that the smaller they are, the kind of the smaller their thinking is, but in fact, their thinking is big and open and, uh, and also they say what they see which we stop doing as we get older because we've learned that we're not supposed to say certain things. But our little ones say what they see and what they think. And so our classrooms can really offer a space for young people to learn words that many of us never learned when we were their age, um, to observe, notice, and name inequity because they will notice when things are not fair. And then to help give them ways of addressing inequity um, from when they're little so that as they grow they actually feel that they have power and they do right they they have power to make change um, from the smallest event uh, like the time that in my block area where <clears throat> the students were supposed to be building uh, a community that functioned in a way that everyone had what they needed there were a few boys that decided they wanted to build a jail. Now, these boys were white and they were about five or six. And I asked them the question, why a jail? Why do you think communities need a jail? 
And this opened these little guys, it opened for them a whole world of possibility. Wait, well, what would you do with the bad guys, they said. And so I asked them, well, who are the bad guys, right? So we have the opportunity to invite young people into thinking that, again, perhaps we were not invited into, um, and we have a kind of an opportunity to shift to the dynamic of, of what's going on in our society. So um, as a teacher, I know I've done a lot of learning. And with this kind of practice, I feel like it's, it's about me as well as is it, it's about the children, right? It's about my learning, it's about my mistakes, it's about my growing from my mistakes. Um, what you're looking at is a, a sweet buddy relationship that began <clears throat> about seven, well, it began probably about 12 years ago now. Um, the relationship ran for seven years. Um, I met an incredible teacher named Vitali. He uh, runs kind of like a one room schoolhouse uh, at, it's called Central High, it's Central High School. It's a continuation school. And Vitali students and my students ended up forming a beautiful relationship. Now my students uh, are in an independent school on the west side of Los Angeles. My students at the time were kindergarten first and second graders. And so my kindergarten first and second graders got to know their big buddies in very deep ways over the course of actually many years, because I had some of them for three years. Uh, here's another sweet photo of them. Um, what happened for me as an educator is I learned so much in the process of building curriculum with my friend Vitaly. I learned that our public and private school models that I think uh, were taught are very different and need to be very different can actually align. Um, <clears throat> I learned that in both of our classroom spaces, we had invited our young people into true student-centered work. And so um, as the students worked and learned together, they actually said out loud, we would visit their classroom, they would visit ours, and they would say out loud, it feels like I'm in my classroom, right? And it was high schoolers in the classroom of a kindergarten, first and second grade, and kindergarten, first and second graders in a high school classroom. Um, I learned to ask questions and not make assumptions. Uh, I discovered during one of our incredible projects uh, that when I wanted to take the students, all of them with their buddies, to Venice Boulevard and walk and hold and hand out these beautiful cards that the students made together with Spanish English translations on the back, their food justice cards. Um, Vitaly, my friend, informed me that in fact, though my students could walk safely on Venice Boulevard, his students could not because of gang violence. So again, like I learned things that I was living in a, a world that I, I wasn't aware. And so I learned awareness. Um, I also learned that these little children built such strong connections with their big buddies. <clears throat> and we kind of flipped the script. I think very oftentimes um, in private schools or private institutions, when we interact with community, there's a, uh, let's see how we can help those other folks, right? Um, this was a total switch flip. Um, our younger students saw their older buddies in the continuation school as their heroes, as their role models. They learned from them. And the older students saw their younger friends similarly as connected. <clears throat> and some of those uh, young people, I believe, um, the ones especially that had the long, deep relationships that went for many years. I'm hoping that when they walk down the street and they see someone who looks different than them, they'll say, oh yeah, that looks like my buddy, right? <clears throat> I also um, really learned the power of art and using art to inspire change making, especially across differences and age differences. And that surprising things can happen, right? Um, initial fears can transform into beautiful opportunities between groups of people. So how does this all happen, right? How can you create 
a relationship between two groups of students that are on the outside seemingly completely different, right? Opposites. Um, one of the, the guides for me <clears throat> is in the framework of the anti-bias education for young children and ourselves, written by Louise German Sparks. Um, the framework is very simple, really, and I feel like it's a framework that if we followed from, you know, preschool through graduate school, we'd be okay. And that is to affirm identity first, right? So that um, my, my work in my classroom is to make sure that all the children feel seen, feel understood, um, and that all the aspects of their social identities, as well as their humanity and their individuality get seen and heard that they, they learn um, about themselves first, and that I, as a teacher, am also understanding myself. I need to understand myself first before I can lean into um, helping young people understand themselves. Here's an example of a young friend who understands himself well. And he was asked the question, he's about six years old, and he was asked the question um, to explain his multicultural identity. Multicultural identity is stuff that make you you, like my skin color, that's my one of my outside identities, and my inside identity is my feelings. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me something else about your family identity? My, f my family identity is that there are lots of things, like, like the Indonesian, Ecuadorian, Filipino, and also and also American and also Ch Chinese. <laughs> so you can hear that he knows himself well. And you can also hopefully notice that there's been a partnership between home and school. So um, the questions that his teacher is asking him about who he is and valuing and validating all the parts of him uh, wouldn't work without you know, him understanding himself, the, all those pieces of his identity, he learned from home, right? And yet um, he was, those, all those parts of him were welcomed in school. Uh, so once identity is affirmed, then engaging across difference is that second piece. And, and this is where um, that buddy relationship was just the most beautiful part of my teaching. Um, understanding, like helping our young people normalize the noticing of difference and then really teaching them language to help them understand how they belong and how all of us belong. Moving into developing an awareness of injustice. So my kindergartners, you meet any five-year-old, they can tell you again when something is fair or not fair. And helping them to develop that understanding of injustice and to see and then challenge stereotypes. Our littlest ones can see patterns and they can notice when something is a stereotype and they can challenge them. It's pretty powerful to hear a five or six year old say that is a stereotype. Um, and lastly, and I think this piece, this, this move towards action is, um, is big. Early in my teaching, I was not keyed in to this fourth um, goal. And I think without it, without helping our young people see themselves as change makers and understand how they can advocate for, for change inside their own communities. Um, we kind of leave them almost like standing on the edge of a cliff. Like, I see the injustice and, right, what am I gonna do about it? So um, this is where I'd like to share with you uh, a short um, five minute video that kind of packages up the feeling um, between the action that it took. It was really an action of, of love between our youngest, our littlest K-1-2 students in their private independent school and um, their, their older buddies in the continuation school. And here we go. First I was nervous because they're a lot older than me. A 
I didn't know what to expect. I like, thought it was going to be a lot of kids running around, not trying to listen. I was skeptical at first, kind of scared like these guys. But after a while, I guess I got to know them and they're cool. It was kind of hard making friends with little kids. You know, something new for me. Hey, look at look at him. Oh, hey. <laughs> I learned that I can teach her some things about myself. That I can be open with her and like to learn about things about her. I learned that I have more patience than I thought. You know, like I just take a deep breath and I could just handle the situation. <laughs> You're my buddy, right? I learned about friendship because if he's brown and I'm white, that doesn't really make a difference. It just makes friendship. They're pretty fun, you know what I mean? They have a lot of energy. They're incredible, man. It's, they just make my day when I come over here. One time, um, we went to St. Elmo Village, and it was cool. What is St. Elmo Village, and why is it? And what it is for me as the co-creator, along with my uncle, Razil Sykes, is this moment and more moments like this. This place is about the love of yourself and others and our need for one another. This place is about what we can do when we don't say too young, too this, too that. You have to take responsibility for you. This is about making smiles, not crying. This place is about people meeting people and discovering difference. And in the discovery of how different we may be, also how much alike we are. Diana, I found something. Everybody had to paint one last week. Well, I like when we do projects together. Well, we painted pots. We passed it that we now have in our garden at my school at Central High. When we include one another, rather than put each other down, we have to accept and see ourselves in each other. And if each of us do our best, without putting somebody else down, then we get it done. You know, it's easy to say a lot of words, and words are powerful. But my life, and what I truly believe is that actions speak louder than your words. It's what you do. It's how you treat yourself and your fellow human beings. For me, that's what life is about, making your contribution. You have to do something today to make your dream your reality. Central High School friends, we're on our way out. I need everybody to go give their buddies a hug. You can learn a lot from them. Like, you can find new ways to do things, like communicate with people. Together, we build community. Being with the Wildwood Kids, it helps me see it from a different perspective. I see it in many perspectives now, you know, I like to see it in, in the perspective of kids. We are the change we see in the world.
That was pretty Let awesome. Thank you. So um, some of the takeaways there are, um, yeah, and I wrote down some of the ideas I was having, like classroom practice. Uh, it's the intentional using of community and facilitating belonging and congeniality and cooperation and understanding and awareness, like you were saying, and affirming students, formulating partnerships between home and community that are meaningful and authentic, right? Um, centered on the, on the emotional development and the um, interpersonal development of the students across ages and across ethnicities is super powerful in that video. Um, noticing difference, being intentional. I think that that is such a huge importance that a lot of our teachers are afraid to notice difference because they haven't quite you know, grapple with their own identities. So if you, you definitely know who you are and you have a, a healthy sense of identity, it becomes easier to notice other people's positive identity as well. And um, <laughs> work to be uh, a social justice advocate and be that social justice, but just inspire action. like. <laughs> It, kids should want to go out and do the thing that you're teaching them once you've taught them and they should feel more like themselves. That video was so indicative of the statement I like to say. Uh, kids should feel more like themselves after you've taught them than before. And that space, kids definitely, I could see everybody feeling more like they self. I didn't know I was this patient. So I'm like, yeah, that's, that's what we mean by that. Like creating and being creative with developing those relationships um, is super important. So I thank you, that, that was awesome. And I can't yeah. wait to share that with the world, uh, that those things are happening right under our noses and we wanna go and experience that kind of thing then, or we wanna create those kind of things that we know where to go. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you haven't been to St. Elmo's Village, you should go. I th yeah. Definitely, that's where I'm, yeah. It's right Good off trip. of Virginia and like between Venice and Washington. Oh, wow. I know exactly where that is. It's like a little hidden gem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it, it's, um, and it's got a little ancestral there too, because he said my uncle started this place. Yeah. So there's some generational crossing and uh, honoring of uh, the ancestors in there too. So. Uh, there's a lot of intersectionality, um, a lot of spirit there that um, I always appreciate when it comes to this profession that we're in. Mm -hmm. So with all that said, uh, thank you um, for sharing your wisdom and pushing this anti-racism series forward. Uh, I'd like to reiterate that you know, anti-racist teaching practice is both practice and intention. Uh, you want to grow kids up so that they feel a level of belonging and awareness of themselves, that they can be positive change agents, not in somebody else's community, but their own. Yes. We're not making second class citizens for somebody else's community. We're honoring the first classness of our kids at home in our own communities. And so uh, that is definitely... Um, uh, one of the goals of this is to empower teachers to see different ways and, and different ways of thinking and doing and knowing when it comes to the care and the protection of, this, of the kids that our communities uh, faithfully give to us every year, especially in a pandemic. Mm. <laughs> especially in a pandemic. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, any closing remarks? No, Keep on I, keeping on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes, no, thank you. And I'm, I'm, uh, you know, you started with healing, restoration, epistemic agency, and I saw that through and through in Monique's, um, you know, they, they're, and there's a lot of pedagogical work that leads to that. Absolutely. And that's like some serious business right there. And so, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, I, and thank you, Antoinette, for um, this series. We're hoping to have something like this at Cal State LA, too. We're slowly getting there. You know, I'm, I'm down for it. Just count me in. I'll bring the popcorn. <laughs>
All right. Talk to y'all soon. Thank you. Bye.